Hello, everybody from Singapore, wherever you may be. I was going to give us another minute uh, to um, before I, we start this session formally, but then since I was muted, I've given myself that minute. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the one before last uh, in the series of 101, Middle East 101 um, webinars by the Middle East Institute uh, of the National University of Singapore. This seminar is going to be focused on uh, the centrality of uh, Central Asia, and there's no one better than uh, to speak about the centrality of the region than uh, Dr. Alexander Arduido, who is a the principal senior research fellow at the Institute. And Alex has spent at least two decades uh, traveling, studying, and uh, analyzing this, uh, Central Asia. I think one only needs to look at a map to see that Central Asia lies smack in the middle of uh, Eurasia, right between, it connects uh, Western, the Western part of Eurasia, which includes Europe, um, and of course the Western part of Russia, uh, with the Eastern part of Eurasia. If we needed a reminder of uh, the centrality and the importance of Central Asia, we got that with a bit of a wake up call this uh, summer in August, with the dramatic US withdrawal from, uh, from Afghanistan that literally changed the um, geopolitical map uh, of the region. We've seen that if one includes uh, the Caucasus uh, in, uh, in Central Asia, we've seen that with last year's Caucasus war between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And of course, we've seen that with rising tensions in the Caspian Sea Basin. So on that note, I'm gonna give the floor to Alex, but before doing that, uh, we really encourage you to take part in this discussion, to uh, post your questions. You can do so through the Q and A. Um, I think you can also do so by raising your hand and we will try and incorporate as many of those questions as we can in the discussion once Alex has made his introductory remarks. Alex, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, James, for the two kind introduction uh, and especially to underline twice senior and two decades of experience. Doesn't make me feel any younger. I will say that uh, you underline and you already helped me to uh, say what are the key notes about today's presentation uh, and uh, is the role, the central role uh, of uh, Central Asian country uh, that uh, is getting back, uh, I have to say, unfortunately, due to the crisis in Afghanistan and another area that is in proximity with Central Asia, that is Nagorno-Karabakh and the frozen conflict in Caucasus. Having said that, please allow me to share my screen. And... Uh, Basically, as James just mentioned, uh, if you just look at the map of Central Asia, we can have all the discussion without moving from this slide. First thing uh, that uh, jumped to the eyes talking about uh, Central Asia is the fact that all the countries involved are landlocked country. If you look at uh, Caspian Sea and Aral Sea, technically are called sea, but are huge lakes. Besides the fact uh, that uh, Aral Sea, uh, since the last 15 years, uh, is slowly disappearing. And as you can see, there are some very particularity about Central Asia, like country like Uzbekistan, who is the only one of the two in the world, I do believe the other one is Luxembourg, who is double landlocked. It means that to reach the sea, you have to cross two countries. And you see that, uh, of course, uh, at the time uh, of historical uh, renaissance of Central Asia, that was at the time of the Silk Road, when the transportation was, uh, the trade was by land, by camel, by horses, uh, the centrality of Central Asia was at utmost importance. But uh, basically today, uh, what I'm planning to do is to give you a picture of Central Asia with a very broad brush. That means that I give you snippet of information and I do hope that some of this information can be of interest for you to dig deeper into Central Asia, historical importance, science, culture, 
geopolitical and economy. Having said that, it's quite interesting if you are interested in look at Central Asia in study uh, about Central Asia, how the research is moved on pretty fast on a different key point since the late 90s. Before the 90s, basically the research of Central Asia that include most of the time, and I say most of the time because sometimes you can see in publication uh, Mongolia, but mostly it refers to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, you look at that since the late 90s, uh, the research on Central Asia was mainly focused, uh, considering the area just as simple as a backwater of Russia. That's not the case. Also, uh, most of the label on Central Asia look at the great game, at the game played by uh, strategic competition by Russia, by China, by the United States, and before that, historically speaking, uh, the, the British Empire and the Tsarist Russian Empire. Having said that, uh, Central Asia offer much more than this. And I'm trying with today's presentation to move on from what are the classical label of Central Asia. I'm sure if you look at Central Asia, the first one and the most known uh, is the new great game. Of course, it's very romantic. Uh, I'm sure many of you have already read uh, Optier book, uh, but then uh, it's not only a Soviet Asia, a West Turkestan, the Heartland, uh, the new Silk Road economic belt with China and the Iron Silk Road with Russia. Central Asia now is first foremost five country that started in the late 90s, very young country, after the, the Soviet Union dissolved. And they have a very commonality. Uh, their father of the nation and president uh, was uh, most of the time the strong man during the Soviet time, a very young population. But they started in these last, uh, let's say, three decades uh, to have their own uh, developing pattern and today central asian country are willing and they are pushing very hard to return to the place of historical relevance that they have been doing during the time of uh, the silk road as i mentioned uh, Kazakhstan, the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan have their own individual development pattern. Uh, during today's lecture, unfortunately, I'm not focusing much uh, uh, the presentation on Turkmenistan for the simple fact uh, that uh, it's very difficult uh, to have a data set on economic, uh, on geopolitics, uh, on the country, uh, even on COVID-19. Up to now, there are no report of COVID-19 case from Turkmenistan, uh, up to my knowledge. And that's basically beside that the country is closed in itself, uh, and some international servers sometimes joke that is basically North Korea without nuclear weapon. But what are the commonality of this country? As I mentioned before, they are trying to build their own national identity, moving on from decades under the Soviet Union. They are in close proximity to major power, and now we are not only talking about uh, Indo-Pacific with United States and China, but mostly is Russia, China, and uh, very important nowadays, the return of Turkey. And then there are a lot of issues between this country in terms of cross-border uh, resource management, and I mean mainly water. Water issue is a very big problem, and uh, it creates uh, in the last decades friction among uh, all this country. Uh, if you travel it in, in the area, as I was doing, for example, uh, for a long time uh, moving from China, it was easier to go to Seoul in Korea and then to jump to Central Asia, that just moving from China at the time, the only airport with uh, a desirable flight was Urumqi in Xinjiang. And then from moving to one country to the other was even better to go uh, to uh, Turkey or go back uh, to, to South Korea and then come back. Now, communication is changing, logistics is changing, but still uh, the common problem are related to the fact that there is a lack of infrastructure Part of it has been addressed by Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, but there are still uh, numerous and very important challenge of economic diversification, job creation and growth, especially in uh, Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan. 
Uh, always, when you look at the area, never forget the role that Russia played and is still playing, as uh, is still one of the largest trade partner, one of the main security provider. But then, uh, in the past decades, the link with China, thanks to the Belt and Road Initiative, increased. And uh, the simplistic view of Russia doing security and China doing business uh, is, offers more nuanced view. It's not just a black and white between one country and the other, but China is increasing its security footprint in the region with a military base in Tajikistan, while Russia with the Eurasian Economic Union is also increasing its economic and trade footprint in, uh, in the region. Having said that, uh, it's quite important, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we are discussing at the Middle East Institute about Central Asia, is the link that Central Asia had with, uh, with the Middle East, uh, and especially with Islam. Islam stream is still, uh, for historical reason and for influential reason, uh, the most important religion in Central Asia. And if you look just briefly in the history, of Central Asia looking uh, after pre-Islam period uh, that was uh, a time with uh, a very strong Persian influence uh, uh, and with the cult uh, of Zoroastrian, of Ahura Mazda. If you look uh, at the beginning of uh, Islam in Central Asia around the 7th century, uh, you have uh, in the two uh, capital and cultural center of the time during the Umayyad Caliphate in Merv and Herat. Uh, nowadays, uh, this uh, uh, area is uh, located uh, in Afghanistan, so we can still see how the definition of Central Asia, including Afghanistan or including Mongolia, is still quite flexible. And at the time uh, when the expansion of the Umayyad Caliphate reached its apex in the area, there was a direct confrontation between Central Asia power and China during the Imperial Tan Dynasty. Uh, then uh, the renaissance of Islam has been seen in the 14th century to the 15th century when uh, uh, the city of Samarkand that nowadays is inside uh, Uzbekistan uh, became uh, the center of Islamic scholarship and science. And then one thing that is very important to remember that at the time uh, with uh, the Silk Road now that we have the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, we can call it the ancient Silk Road. There were not only uh, spice, silk, porcelain, and other traded goods that were moving along the, the several roads uh, connecting China with uh, the Roman Empire and after on with uh, medieval Europe, but also they were moving idea. Uh, Samarkand and Bukhara as the center of uh, science uh, was very important during the time uh, and the uh, concept about uh, trigonometry, uh, spheric geometry were moving from Central Asia, even reaching Europe uh, uh, through Spain, for example. But then uh, uh, this changed abruptly uh, in the 1920s and especially from 1920, 30 years to 1950, uh, when the Bolshevik Revolution started uh, to uh, design the border, the culture, the language, even uh, uh, the cultural artifact of the region. So nowadays, borders of Central Asian country are still built on the Bolshevik uh, concept of, uh, of Soviet. Then, uh, as I mentioned before, we can use one picture, still more than 1,000 words, uh, and if you look at this picture, it's, it's quite important because you can see uh, mostly of the father of the nation, uh, the one that I was mentioned previously. Of course, the first thing that jumps into your eyes is the fact that President Xi Jinping is quite high, even compared to his uh, Central Asian peers. But moving from the left to the right, uh, we can see Tajikistan President Rahmon, that is still president of Tajikistan now. Uh, he was not, uh, I do believe, uh, the, the strongest man during the Soviet time, but he was able to acquire power uh, very rapidly when the Tajikistan Republic uh, formed as an independent state from the Soviet Union. And since then, Rahmon is still consolidating his power in Tajikistan. And if you look at the election, most of the time, uh, uh, 
his approval rate is over 90%, something very similar to the other strongmen in Central Asia. Then if we move to uh, the Republic of Kyrgyz, uh, at the time was President Atambayev. Now, if I recall correct, uh, the president uh, is uh, just been elected not long ago and is Sadir Japarov. Uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, is quite different from the other country. It moved more, uh, let's say, tried uh, on the democratic side. It was married by civil war. There was a very uh, bitter confrontation, uh, especially in the city of Osh, that led hundreds of people dead. And there is a change of government that is not very dissimilar from the one where I come from, from Italy, that you change prime minister basically on a monthly basis. Now we move to the center of the picture, and it's very important because it's the father of nation in Kazakhstan. First president, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. As mentioned before, he was the strong man during the Soviet time, has great relationship with uh, Vladimir Putin, but also a very good relationship with President Xi Jinping. If you look at uh, 2013, it was not by chance uh, that during his trip uh, in uh, Kazakhstan, President Xi Jinping uh, explained for the first time uh, his vision of the Belt and Road Initiative. And it was at Nur Sultan University, a university in the capital uh, that now is called uh, Nur Sultan, previously was uh, uh, Astana. And in the capital, uh, President Xi Jinping uh, proposed the vision of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, with a strong support from Kazakhstan. So it's quite important to look at Central Asia as uh, a testing bench of what's going on uh, with the Belt and Road, because uh, Central Asian country, uh, with exclusion uh, of Uzbekistan at the beginning, that was quite skeptical in accepting uh, Chinese investment and especially Chinese infrastructure, uh, it's quite important benchmark to see what's going on with the Belt and Road Initiative, especially due to the fact that there was several occasions where the local population start to have confrontation that escalated into violence uh, with the Chinese worker due to the fact uh, that there was a perception that they were stealing their job or even polluting the area where they were operating. And then if we move jumping from Putin and Xi Jinping to the last uh, on the right, uh, then is Islam Karimov father of the nation in Uzbekistan. He passed away not long ago. Uh, and uh, there is a new president, Shavkrat Mirzoyev, who uh, is basically giving a lot of hope for his country. It's a very young country, the population is very young, and under Mirzoyev, uh, there is uh, the perception that even uh, with the economic constraint caused by COVID-19, uh, Uzbekistan is going to develop uh, pretty fast, giving the chance to everybody to find a proper job. We are supposed to see, as I mentioned before, that all these countries with exception or uh, Turkmenistan and uh, Kazakhstan, who are blessed by an abundance uh, of oil and gas resource, all the other countries struggle with a problem related to a slow developing economy that is also inherited from the Soviet Union. At the time of the Soviet Union, each country was focused only on doing one thing. For example, Uzbekistan was cotton. And still cotton in Uzbekistan is a very important part of the economy, but uh, it lack of mechanization and uh, of uh, several other resource, uh, logistical resource that only now are getting developed. If you look at this picture, there is something missing, and uh, it's the president of uh, Turkmenistan, the Turkmenbashi. This picture is uh, from uh, a meeting, uh, let me say it was uh, in uh, Ufa, in, uh, in Russia, uh, of the SEO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, of which Uzbekistan was jumping in and out for a while, but Turkmenistan uh, being a, a country that is not aligning with one side or the other and is trying to keep neutrality was not in. So if we look uh, at the father of uh, Turkmenistan, that is the name in which he is uh, referred to in his nation, and I'm talking about uh, Sapar Murat Niazov, you can see a golden statue, it's gold, in, uh, in the capital, in Ashgabat. Uh, and when he passed away, his, uh, when he died, uh, his place was taken by the Ministry of Health, uh, 
uh, that is Gurbanguly Berdi Mukhanagov, and he is the president still now. If you look at all this succession, with uh, notable exception of the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, there is something uh, that is quite interesting. As James mentioned early, I've been looking at Central Asia for a while, and uh, in the 90s, uh, most uh, of the analysts, especially the one from the West, they were betting on the fact that uh, when uh, the father of the nation or the strong man is going to have a weakened power, not only die for natural causes, as has happened to Karimov or to Niazov, there will be a bloodbath in Central Asia. There will be a revolution, there will be some kind of colored revolution. It didn't happen at all. As I mentioned, with the exception of the Kyrgyz Republic, that there was violence and at the time even civil war. Of course, if you look at Turkmenistan, you have basically zero data set coming from the country is a country blessed by oil and gas and with a very strong authoritarian government but then as i mentioned before we just step back a little bit uh, on the history of central asia and uh, a very important part has been played uh, by central asia as connecting with the ancient silk road to part of the world something that now uh, is still back on track thanks to the belt and road initiative but is different if we look at the time there was a need in the roman empire and there was a product and by the way silk was just a very small part it was mostly spice moving from one side to the other so let's say it was a homogeneous market Nowadays, in the modern Silk Road, is not the case because China has the product, but China also has the money that is borrowing to all the countries that are going to accept uh, its infrastructure. Moving to that, as I mentioned before, I just give you one slide to remember that Central Asia is not just a crossroad for merchants, but was uh, a scientific capital for several hundred years, uh, giving birth to very important uh, uh, scientific uh, cultural figure uh, and one of the most famous uh, was uh, a, a polymath uh, Ibn Sina. He was born uh, in 980 uh, and as I mentioned as a polymath uh, he wrote uh, a very important book uh, on uh, medical uh, research called the canon that was used uh, for a really long time and it reached Europe through uh, Spain when at the time uh, the, the area was uh, under the Arab control. But uh, Ibsina, known with his Latin name of Avicenna, also was a very influential Islamist philosopher. And it's said that uh, his writing influenced uh, European philosopher like Thomas of Aquina, for example. Then if we move into science, Uluk Beg, uh, I think he was the, the grandson of the great conqueror Timur. And uh, he was uh, a sultan, but also a very uh, talented mathematician. And he was working on astronomy, on doing mathematical calculation to draw map and to help uh, the caravanserai and the movement on goods and trade. So basically they developed, and you can still see the astronomic observatory in Bukhara, that is a really beautiful one with the museum of Ulanbeg, and uh, they had an antiliteram GPS to help all the trader to move their goods uh, in the deserts uh, and along uh, the Silk Road. And of course, uh, uh, if we look at Central Asia, including part of Iran, of modern Iran and modern Afghanistan, Timur and the Timurid Renaissance was a very important part of the history of the era in the 15th to the 17th century, uh, in which uh, uh, Timur uh, was basically seeing himself as the new Genghis Khan, and he was able, as being one of the world most uh, uh, renewed tactician and strategist, he was able to conquer a very vast part of the area and his heir like Uluk Beg, and also I think his great grandson Babur were at the helm of empire that moved until south of uh, India. So I mean, say that there was just a very brief overlook on the importance of uh, Central Asia 
that is not only what is seen or a new great game or uh, this focus uh, on trade uh, and the new Silk Road. But Central Asia up to now is also unfortunately plagued by problem that were discussed just a few weeks ago in the COP26 meeting. You can see, if you remember the map that we just saw a few minutes ago about the Aral Sea, this huge lake that is called the sea, but you can see in only 20 years how uh, it's basically evaporating. So it's quite normal to see uh, where it was water before a mixed desert uh, and uh, the picture of the water resource in Central Asia is very bleak for the year to come and is always a frequent source of friction between neighboring country, especially in country where the water is used for electrical power and other country need the same water for their agricultural and uh, land use. Again, as I mentioned, I'm trying just to give you a very broad picture of what's going on in Central Asia. Uh, and then you can, in uh, your question, focus on what matters most for you. Having said that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Central Asia have a very young population and they are really looking forward uh, to move out from the Soviet heritage. Uh, uh, this picture, I took it when I was uh, in Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, just uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, I think, uh, mostly. And at the time, the Juventus football team from Italy was setting up uh, a football school. Uh, to uh, train uh, the future star in football, not only for Uzbekistan, but for all Central Asia. So you can see uh, the country, Uzbekistan especially, is trying to move out uh, from the shadow cast uh, of the Soviet uh, industrial development, uh, looking at a new future. But unfortunately, uh, with COVID-19, uh, the economic constraint uh, and the possibility for uh, a sustainable development is going to be difficult uh, by the day. Let me say that tourism is still a very important part. I took this picture when I was in Bukhara uh, in the caravanserai that I mentioned before. Uh, and the ancient Silk Road uh, is still uh, a very important part of revenue for the country, especially Uzbekistan, that uh, have two of three of the main city of the Silk Road who are Samarkand, Bukhara and uh, Chiba. We say that uh, Central Asian population uh, is still uh, very dispersed uh, if you look uh, at the number. We are talking about a little bit more than 72 million, but if you look at the map that uh, we were using before, basically the entire area of Central Asia is well bigger than uh, the European Union. Uh, having Uzbekistan as the most populous country, followed by Kazakhstan. And the picture in the center, beside the very bleak picture of the drying up of Ara Lake, uh, is Samarkand. And then, uh, as mentioned by James uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, the problems that are stemming out uh, we can see in two areas. One, the unfrozen conflict in Caucasus between uh, Armenia and uh, in, in the Nagorno-Karabakh area, and uh, the one that uh, is now under everybody's eyes, uh, and it was uh, related to the fall of Kabul in August 15, uh, the suboptimal withdrawal of the United States. Uh, and now you can see in the picture below, uh, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan with the Taliban at the government, but also with the picture on the top right uh, with the Islamic State in Khorasan province spreading anxiety all over Central Asia. While still uh, we can question a lot what's going on in uh, China or in Russia uh, of a possible spread of a terrorist threat uh, from Afghanistan, Central Asian countries like Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, or even Uzbekistan are scrambling as we speak to try to contain not only terrorist threat spreading from Afghanistan, but also problem like new wave of migration and opioid trade. Uh, drug trade, uh, weapon smuggling uh, is a huge problem on all the border that are between uh, Afghanistan and the Central Asian countries. 
Having said that, uh, uh, security is still uh, pretty high in the area. Uh, country like Uzbekistan or more far like Kazakhstan are doing pretty well in the defending uh, their border against infiltration from terrorist group. But then uh, uh, Central Asia in the recent years also witnessed uh, quite important attack that at the time were considered a lone wolf attack. The two pictures at the top uh, are a bomb attack against the Chinese uh, uh, embassy in uh, Kyrgyzstan and the other is in Tajikistan and was uh, a terrorist attack, I don't recall correctly, was affiliate from ISIS uh, that uh, killed a group of uh, Western tourists that they were biking overland uh, doing Central Asia. As I mentioned, these are uh, very sporadic attack, uh, but the anxiety stemming out of uh, Afghanistan uh, is still present, is still palpable, and even as I mentioned before, a multilateral organization like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization just started uh, their existence with a very important focus on Afghanistan. Then, uh, this is quite interesting in my opinion, why Singapore matters for Central Asia. Maybe most uh, of your attention here in Singapore, and especially for Singaporean students, uh, is not much related to the country in Central Asia, but uh, if Singapore in some way is not looking at Central Asia, Central Asia is looking at Singapore. And uh, for, uh, for a really long, uh, long time, so uh, this uh, quote that I mentioned below is taken from uh, autobiography from uh, President Nazarbayev after his meeting with Lee Kuan Yew. And if you look uh, at uh, especially Kazakhstan and at the media in Kazakhstan for several years, now and then it appears quote about the Singapore model how Central Asia and especially Kazakhstan is trying to tailor its uh, government model on uh, Lee Kuan Yew, on Singapore. And it's quite important in my opinion, uh, not only uh, because uh, there are already ongoing collaboration, like for example, uh, LKY uh, and US, uh, is supporting uh, Nazarbayev University in, uh, in Kazakhstan for, for many years, but also for the possibility for uh, Singaporean businessmen and Singaporean company to do business in the area as they are perceived as a successful businessman and Singapore as a government is uh, widely known as a model for Central Asia. Okay, now I'm just giving you a very quickly uh, look at uh, economic development in the country. Uh, as I mentioned before, Kazakhstan, like Turkmenistan, is blessed by hydrocarbon reserve, but unfortunately is also a curse uh, due to the Dutch disease. When the price of oil per barrel is over 100 US dollar per barrel, then uh, the country can develop pretty fast but now as we can see the price since the economic crisis in 2008 has been dwindling then Kazakhstan economy has been hit very bad. Uh, considering easy to do business uh, is one of the most easiest country in Central Asia but don't forget uh, that if you look uh, at the World Bank uh, data set, IMF data set, uh, EBRD and so on also, uh, there is a problem in all Central Asia, especially in the south part of Central Asia, that is related to corruption. So ease of to-do business uh, start to have uh, several issues in, uh, in that area. Nevertheless, uh, uh, succession, as I mentioned before, of President Nazarbayev was uh, very straightforward, while President Nazarbayev still have a lot of uh, clout in, uh, in Kazakhstan, and it's quite interesting to look at some detail of the new president, President Tokayev, who is really well known in Singapore, and he is also quite fluent in the Chinese language. And then Kazakhstan, as all the other countries in Central Asia, have this kind of balancing between uh, China and Russia relation. Multivector policy is a game uh, like in Asian uh, that this country have learned to play since their inception. If we look uh, at the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, it's very different. It's, uh, 
is different uh, perception than the one that we have on the Kazakh possibility of economic development and sustainable development, as first and foremost, the economy is very small. Uh, as Tajikistan, uh, an important part of the revenue is from foreign worker, from worker moving from uh, Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan to work in Russia. So every time Russia has some issue with these two countries, it can just uh, uh, pretend that it's going to insert some restriction or even visa. That is not the case now. You don't need uh, a working visa to move from Tajikistan. But this kind of restriction can affect severely the economy in these two countries. And then Russia is always playing this card when they need something from uh, these two countries. And of course, there are a lot of disputes, as I mentioned before, that range from land, water conflict, border, religious extremism, especially in the area of the Fergana Valley, and then uh, drug smuggling, more than in Kyrgyz and Tajik, uh, it's, a, it's a huge problem. And then uh, COVID-19, unfortunately, increased all this kind of problem. If you see that during a lockdown, you don't have a possibility to move, and then the, the foreign worker cannot migrate from Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan to Russia or to the other area, then it's a, it's a huge problem, compounded with inflation, of course, increase of food price, and so on. Same uh, as uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan is still struggling with decades of poverty and instability. Uh, from uh, a trade perspective, China is very important, but still uh, Russia is one uh, of, uh, of the leading country in uh, the relationship with Tajikistan. And if we look uh, at the relationship with Afghanistan, with country, neighboring country like Kyrgyzstan, or even uh, not neighboring, but quite nearby proximity like Uzbekistan, uh, there is an interest uh, to promote trade with the Taliban in order to avoid an humanitarian crisis, a new wave of migration from Afghanistan. But Tajikistan took a completely different uh, approach uh, and just last month uh, for at least twice uh, increased the training and war game together with Russia. Tajikistan hosts several Russian bases military bases along uh, its border. And just nowadays, even if there is not much talk about it, uh, China opened its second military base. First one was in the Horn of Africa, in Djibouti, and now the new base uh, is in Tajikistan, not far from the uh, border with Afghanistan. China is bordering with Afghanistan, but the corridor, the so-called Wuhan corridor, is only 92 kilometers, heavily mined, very high in the mountain and very difficult to cross. So it's not a direct issue. While Tajikistan, a weak Tajikistan, is a, a severe problem, not only for Central Asia, but also for China. Having said that, we can move okay, to Turkmenistan and then oil and gas. It was linked with Russia, with main customer from Gazprom and Rosneft. And now more than 90% of the gas from Turkmenistan is moving to Xinjiang and from Xinjiang to Shanghai. Uh, it still presents itself uh, as a neutral country. Uh, and it's very difficult, let me mention another time, uh, to get any kind of information. Even if you look uh, at the World Bank statistic uh, uh, in easy of doing business uh, or other statistics, always Turkmenistan is left out uh, for the lack uh, not only of reliable data, for any kind of data set, uh, as the government uh, maintain a very strong grip on all form of communication on whatever is political sensitive. So uh, in this, uh, up to now, the security is still focused on the border with Afghanistan, and especially in uh, avoiding infiltration from the Islamic State uh, in uh, Khorasan province in the northern part of Afghanistan. Last but not least, Uzbekistan. As I mentioned before, President Shokrat Mirzoyev, following Karimov's dead, is leading a very ambitious program to develop the country. Uh, Uzbekistan increased his position in ease of doing business uh, ranking by the World Bank, but still corruption, heavy bureaucracy, uh, is a problem that is quite common uh, to uh, all Central Asia. But on the good side, uh, uh, 
the political risk has decreased sensibly, is very stable, and uh, the transition with Islam Karimov, 30, 27 years of rule, was uh, extremely smooth. Of course, uh, media, uh, political debate and opposition is extremely limited. And again, Uzbekistan is also feeling the pressure of terrorist threat from Islamic extremists. There is uh, an important number of Uzbek foreign fighters, not in Afghanistan, but mostly from uh, Islamic State in previous area controlled by the Islamic State. And uh, there is always uh, in Tashkent the fear that these trained veteran are uh, in a way or in the other coming back. And uh, internally to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Tashkent host the regional anti-terrorism structure that in Chinese and Russian sound quite good, uh, but the acronym uh, in English, RETS, uh, definitely is not giving much of uh, what they are really doing there. Current perception of Central Asia is still related to, to oil and gas, uh, but with the dwindling of uh, the price uh, of oil and gas, uh, uh, all the countries are scrambling in developing a sound industry, uh, small medium enterprises with the support uh, of China, of uh, Asian Development Bank, uh, Islamic Development Bank, uh, and the European Union. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, it, it all started the one belt, one road. At the time when President Xi Jinping in 2013 mentioned the Eurasian economic belt uh, at uh, Nazarbayev University, uh, was still a lot of question, what is this one belt and one road? And now with the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, after more than eight years, it's, it's more clear. But you see in area like Korgos and Kashgar, it was uh, quite important, it's still now development this crossroad, and you move down, still this link, especially with uh, the cooperation between Singapore and the city of Chongqing, uh, is getting quite interesting, as there is a possibility, still on paper, to see product from Kazakhstan, from Central Asia, especially dairy product, fruit, uh, uh, lamb moving from the area and reaching uh, Asian and also Singapore. As I mentioned before, uh, the country are playing uh, a very difficult uh, and fluid game uh, in terms of geopolitical transition and reality, having uh, a common interest between China and Russia in security and stability. That's something that both countries want uh, in Central Asia. No Russia, nor China is interested in an unstable Central Asia, but especially now that you have a third power jumping in, that is Turkey. Then energy production and transit is an area where China and Russia compete, as well as as trade. Uh, there is this impression that China is dominating the business side. It's increasing the space, of course, but also Russia with its economic, common economic space that moved into Eurasian economic union uh, it's a very important player with all this country. And don't forget uh, that besides having their own national language, uh, the language used in trade, in business, in government uh, is the Russian language. Although uh, Chinese Confucius Institute uh, are increasing the space, uh, there is a number of uh, students, especially from uh, Uzbekistan and uh, Kazakhstan, that are studying Chinese language as a third uh, or even as a fourth language. Uh, the young population of Central Asia, they are blessed to the fact that they can speak Russian, their local language, uh, quite easily speak English, and now they add uh, also Chinese to, to their curricula. It's quite, uh, it's quite normal. I think we are getting near uh, to the Q&A. Just let me uh, summarize the challenge about this country. As I said before, they are still uh, bent uh, on the fact that they are building their national identity. They have still problem of internal stability, border issue. Uh, they are under SEO, CSTO, looking at fight the so-called three evils of terrorism, separatism, and religious extremism. Beside terrorism, uh, in my opinion, drug smuggling is a huge issue that unfortunately, and especially in these years, uh, is going not enough noticed as it has to be. 
and then all the problem of costume union. But to see all the player in Central Asia and are in this list are not all, but just to give you the sense of the alphabet soup of all the cooperation, organization and interest that are moving in Central Asia. And I just put few of them for example, AIB is not there yet, but you can see in this alphabet soup all the converging interests from East Asia to uh, the European Union converging in uh, to Central Asia. We say that, uh, just look at Russia and China. What are the key points? Russia, soft power is still there. I know that talking about soft power and Russia sound like an oxymoron, as Russia expresses uh, its power on the hard way, that is the military one. But don't forget uh, that not only the Russian language, especially in countries like Kazakhstan, is still very important language, uh, and also there is an important uh, Russian ethnic uh, presence in country like Uzbekistan, but especially in the west uh, eastern part of uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, of course, uh, from the Russian standpoint, the Eurasian Economic Union doesn't have the strength and the projection of promise of wealth that the BRI is offering now, but still Russia is able in some way to cope uh, with the growth of China economic intervals. And uh, compared to this, uh, to the SEO, China has the CSTO with some of the uh, country in Central Asia and with Belarus uh, that have uh, the advantage of the fact that most all the country in Central Asia have their official top general trained in Moscow. All the manual are in Russian and mostly all uh, the military material come from Russia too. And that's quite important. And then, of course, China, as mentioned before, started very early, even before the Belt and Road Initiative, with uh, renminbi currency swap, its inroad in uh, Central Asia, and an active participation mostly of state-owned enterprises in the mining and extractive sector, and later on with the BRI in the infrastructure sector. Having said that, uh, uh, there is still a convergence and divergence between Middle East and Central Asia. There is still an influence of the Middle East, but then uh, as the Middle East developed in a different way, away from its colonial past, uh, Central Asia was deeply influenced by the life under Soviet system. So you will see that Islam is still there, but it's a different setting of Islam. And the Islam uh, is not uh, part of the legitimacy of uh, uh, the government, for example. And then, of course, uh, the problem that both Middle East and Central Asia is facing now is the impact of COVID-19 and all the vulnerability that uh, COVID-19 uh, increased and stressed uh, during uh, this, uh, this late two years. I just give you uh, this uh, slide uh, is the number of cases. And you can see that in Central Asia, still COVID-19 per person have uh, uh, less case compared to Europe, for example. And now Europe, just as we speak, uh, is being hit by the fourth wave, especially in Romania, Austria, uh, Austria and uh, in Germany. But then uh, again, what we are missing in this picture, Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan didn't record one case of uh, COVID-19 as the, the picture, the, the statistic was taken and was uh, at the end of uh, the 2020 by uh, OECD. And then this we can go a little bit faster. Then what are the government trying to do from a, a financial, economic and macroeconomic standpoint? First and foremost is the reform of the banking sector. That's why it's quite important for countries like Kazakhstan who want to become the center of banking to uh, cooperate with countries like Singapore, who in uh, East Asia uh, is one of the leading, if not the leading in terms of uh, banking system and fintech. And then all the problems that are inherited from the Soviet time, inefficient public spending and limited fiscal revenues. Having said that, uh, I think that with this last slide, uh, then we can uh, conclude uh, they are still moving with Chinese support, uh, European know-how to modernize what is uh, 
uh, still uh, a very strong uh, industrial sector related to the Soviet time. And then uh, there are a lot of structural changes uh, that there still need to be done. For example, there is a picture down about cotton. It's from Uzbekistan. And just a few years ago, when it was time for harvesting, there was not mechanized harvesting. All the university and the high school were getting closed and the student, and not only the student, but also the professor were going to take the cotton by hand. And of course, this is changing now and is looking forward in uh, developing in a more faster, sustainable way if COVID-19 will give to the country the, the chance in, uh, in doing that. And now, James, the floor is back to you for uh, the Q&A. Thank you very much. Alex, thank you for a sweeping and comprehensive uh, overview of uh, Central Asia that uh, sparks lots of food for thought and, of course, lots of questions. I want to start off with two questions, which I'll pose separately from one another, that were being posed by uh, our Middle East Institute colleague, Georgi Bsutin. His first question is, um, what, 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 what degree of economic integration are you seeing among the Central Asian states? Okay, thank you for the question. That's uh, one of the biggest challenge uh, that Central Asian country have uh, and are still trying to face in right now. As I mentioned before, and uh, it was not by chance, uh, when I was traveling to Central Asia, most of the time I was based at Ablai Khan University in Almaty in Kazakhstan, and from there moving for doing research uh, in other areas of Central Asia. It was easier to fly to Dubai, to Istanbul, even going Easter to Seoul, and then go to another country, then just cross 30 minute, one hour fly to move to another country. Regional integration is still uh, a problem. In the past uh, 20 years ago was a huge problem. It was very difficult to move in cross-border area. There was still area marred by local ethnic conflict and I'm referring to the Fergana Valley. But having said that, uh, Central Asian country realize uh, the need for integration and uh, for a common market. Uh, you see, the map is huge, but the population is quite limited. As I mentioned before, we are just talking about 72 million persons, and it makes uh, a quite a small market. In some area that you compound together, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, uh, you don't even make the market of one Chinese city. So in order to boost the economy, regional integration uh, is the secret recipe that everybody knows, but nobody is still willing to, to do it properly. Uh, European Union uh, with the European Bank of Reconstruction of Development, uh, Asian Development Bank uh, with CAREC, uh, uh, they tried uh, very hard as well as, as the World Bank uh, to uh, found mechanism in order to promote uh, this uh, uh, economic cooperation. It's still getting there, but not 100% because as I mentioned before, there are still friction that are related not only to border dispute, but especially uh, to, to the water issue. Water issue that are not only common between uh, countries in Central Asia, but also with China, because China is increasing use water uh, for agricultural purpose in Xinjiang and uh, uh, not letting the flow of the river moving to Central Asia, why country like Tajikistan and Uzbekistan has a huge dispute uh, for uh, uh, steel mill, uh, polluting uh, water, water uh, and uh, creating uh, uh, severe illness and problem in, in the population. So as, uh, as the question from, from Georgi, uh, it's, it's quite important, is one of the core issues for a, a real sustainable development of, uh, of Central Asia. Thank you. What I want to do is pick up on Georgi's second question, but also link that to questions by two or three other uh, people in the audience, as well as a, a, a question that I have. Georgi's question is whether or not Turkish as a language has the potential of, be, uh, of replacing Russia as a dominant language in, the, uh, in Central Asia, given the Turkic origin 
of, of, of many of those in Central Asia. Uh, I mean, Lutfi has been asking about whether or not uh, Turkish charities are play an influential role in um, Central Asia and whether or not they have um, maybe taken over from Gulf-based charities in the past. And Nada uh, Hassan asked about a more, more, more general question about the diplomatic relations between Central Asia and the Middle East uh, and areas of cooperation. If I can add my own to that, uh, you've mentioned Turkey, but you haven't really uh, expanded on it. We saw last week the meeting of the Turkic Council, which groups uh, Turkic states. And, and what happened at that council meeting was that the, uh, the criteria for membership or for even being observer were tightened in that it has to be a Turkic speaking language country. And so the question is, in the geopolitical positioning that we're seeing in Central Asia, it may not be just Russia and China, is it not also Turkey? And of course, the one player that you didn't mention is Iran. Yes, on that, uh, definitely uh, there is a part of influence from Iran uh, and is a growing influence uh, that also is rooted for historical region. As I mentioned before, I tried to give uh, a broad picture uh, as in 50 minutes talking about history, economic, geopolitical relations, and security relations of Central Asia. You need to let something out. Uh, getting back to that, uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, uh, Istanbul is getting back into the game in Central Asia. Uh, it started with vengeance uh, in Caucasus uh, with the sale uh, of uh, Bakhtiar TB2 drones uh, that are basically on a want to buy list of every army in, uh, in the area. But then uh, we don't have to discount uh, the fact uh, that country like Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, in some respect, even going to Kyrgyzstan, have a very strong uh, cultural influence from Turkey. Uh, as Amim asked, uh, charity from Turkey in this area are still worse, very active. Uh, there was an up and down while uh, there is a dwindling of activity from, uh, from the Middle East and especially uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia, but still a very important player in the area, for example, is the Aga Khan Foundation. Having said that, why Turkey is important? For example, when I was traveling intensively in the area and I meet with local colleagues, uh, it was quite a, a badge of honor for them to say that they did the high school locally, but in the Turk high school, not in their local high school. So they start to learn uh, Turk language uh, even before uh, Russian. While if you move more eastward and you go to Kazakhstan, then this kind of influence, uh, of course, is narrowing down. Uh, uh, influence for Turkey was, was still there. Uh, in the early time of Kazakhstan, you could only buy two kinds of product. Chinese product uh, at the time were expensive due to the landlocked part of Turkish product, who were even more expensive than the Chinese one. And that was uh, the option. Having said that, in terms of influence, cultural influence from Turkey is very important. And they also play into that uh, the fact uh, that there is a commonality of language. Commonality of language that is not only limited to a uh, Central Asian border, but that also span to uh, the Western part of uh, China, that is Xinjiang we still have the same uh, uh, language root. Uh, and it's not the case that, uh, and it was quite strange, I have to say, that with the first uh, uh, diplomatic tour of Erdogan uh, to China, the first step was not Beijing, but was Urumqi. I mean, say that, uh, I think, James, you asked me like five or six questions. <laughs> so hopefully I'm, I'm getting right to answer all. Uh, diplomacy uh, from the Middle East uh, to Central Asia, uh, is still there, but uh, it doesn't look uh, uh, having the driver in terms of uh, economic funding, especially for the madrasa and from uh, the study of, uh, of religion that it has in the past. Iran has not to be discounted. Why? Uh, if you travel in a in, in city like uh, Samarkand, especially Bukhara, and you look uh, at the cultural artifact, you will see a lot of religious theme with animal drawing. 
that is something that is not under Sunni Islam, it's under Shia Islam. And uh, this kind of culture comes directly from Iran. But uh, the Iranian uh, cultural footprint uh, and influence uh, uh, dwindled for a long time. Uh, and now, uh, with exception of uh, Tajikistan, uh, in other area of, uh, of Central Asia is, uh, is still uh, uh, not so up to the game as it was uh, centuries before. And as I said before, charity, uh, Muslim charity, are still uh, present uh, mostly uh, in the south part of Central Asia, why in country like uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan are uh, looked upon uh, with uh, always uh, a double measure of doubt and, uh, and welcome. But that's, as I mentioned before, still uh, uh, investment from China in country like Uzbekistan has been welcome only in the recent years, while before uh, there was the, the suspect that the Chinese investment were just uh, a way for China to have uh, a political inroad in, into the area. We don't have to forget uh, that all Central Asia uh, is still under, in some way, the cloud uh, of Sinophobia or yellow peril. In this country, since the time of the Tsar, China was portrayed uh, as a country that was ready to inundate Central Asia by migrant worker and to steal the land. And this uh, uh, yellow peril, or if you want to call it xenophobia, uh, developed also during the Soviet propaganda, moving from the Tsar one to the Soviet propaganda in Central Asia. And even now, if the relationship, besides the fact that the relationship are getting better with China, at uh, not at elite level, but the ground level of the population, it still percolates around the population, this uh, doubt cast uh, on what is, uh, there is any kind of hidden agenda spawning from, from China and the Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you. Um, before we move on thematically, I want to follow up with um, another Turkey or Turkic related question that was posed both by Amin and by um, Edwina, which is uh, whether, to what degree do pan-Turkic ideologies have, um, uh, have a following in Central Asia? To what degree do Turkic separatist movements have a following in Central Asia? And I would add to that certainly with, a, with, a, with Afghanistan and um, things like the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, of Uzbekistan, to what degree do Islamist and jihadist organizations, philosophies, movements have a following in Central Asia? Yes, on, on this, uh, we can step back uh, before uh, the fall of Kabul uh, this, uh, this August. Already uh, in uh, 2009, when uh, NATO uh, was looking uh, at the date, we almost forgot that, it was 2014. It when uh, the Secretary General of NATO uh, was at the time was Ramzusen, uh, who mentioned that by 2014, the coalition force will move out from Afghanistan. And at the time, the US president was Barack Obama, and he always thought that uh, the NATO uh, was not uh, a deadline. It was uh, a kind of suggestion. So at the time, Obama, uh, together with the, the general uh, David Patreos, that was commander in the area, looked at increase the footprint of the military force in order to decrease it after. Uh, to leave Afghanistan. So since 2019, looking at 2014, Central Asia, Russia and China scrambled to address uh, the, the problem that was very real for them of extremists using Afghanistan as a jumpstart platform. For Uzbekistan uh, was mostly uh, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, ATIM. For China is still the TIP, Turkestan Islamic Party. And uh, uh, serious threat now that are uh, more in, uh, in the Middle East still, like group like Imam Bukhara, who is uh, uh, mainly built upon a veteran battle-hardened fighter from Uzbekistan, willing to move the jihad uh, back home. So since then, uh, uh, it come out the narrative of the three evil of uh, separatism, extremism and terrorism, that SEO, CSTO, and other regional organizations were bent uh, to confront. That's uh, an area also 
related to the fact uh, that we don't have to forget that uh, uh, these movements uh, are not only now using Afghanistan as uh, a jumpstart point uh, to getting back into Central Asia, but also in the early 2000, uh, there was a lot of government repression on uh, uh, movement that are that were labeled as a terrorist organization that were probably not terrorist organization. So still, uh, uh, to getting back to your question, James, uh, the numbers of uh, these uh, jihadists willing to move uh, back to Central Asia waging jihad uh, is still uh, uh, a big problem because uh, sometimes uh, these numbers are overinflated for one side to increase military spending or budget on for other side uh, to use it as uh, an efficient scapegoat uh, to uh, quell and repress uh, uh, protests in some area that are totally unrelated to terrorist activities. Thank you. Um, Edwina also asked an, uh, about the involvement or the engagement of Pakistan in uh, Central Asia. Obviously, there was a very strong engagement in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, but she, she and, and alongside the engagement of Pakistan, she asked about the uh, engagement of India. And perhaps in all of that context, it may be worthwhile if you can talk about the future of the port of Chabahar, which India was going to use for its trade with Central Asia and Afghanistan in the wake of the US withdrawal. Yes, thank you. That's uh, a very interesting question because it matches economic reality with geopolitical reality. Uh, having said that, uh, India uh, is perceived uh, uh, as the main loser in the Afghanistan fall, uh, in some part also with Saudi Arabia having lost position, while Pakistan, of course, uh, the Director General of the Intelligence Service, ISI, uh, was spot early on uh, in Afghanistan in Kabul Hotel talking with his uh, uh, counterpart uh, from the Ministry of Defense uh, uh, and the uh, Haqqani Network. Pakistan game in Afghanistan has always been there while China uh, uh, is making its inroad. India uh, is always played on the defensive, uh, but also we have to say in this, uh, it get a more bigger picture uh, with the US leaving uh, and with China having more possibility, not only in Central Asia, but also in Iran. And we look uh, at the 25 years uh, agreement that has been signed in which the port of Chabahar uh, is getting less and less uh, uh, scope of operation from India, besides the fact that India invested heavily uh, in developing uh, the rail connection with, uh, with the port. There is another dream about connectivity and is not the logistic one, and by dream is a pipe dream, is the one about TAPI about connecting the port uh, with oil and gas from Turkmenistan passing by India and uh, Afghanistan. Something that uh, for many years has been discussed, but uh, is still uh, not uh, looking viable from any mean uh, if you talk with people with experience uh, in, the, in the energy. Thank you. Uh, Emily asks that even though Central Asia is a developing region mired in poverty and having to juggle multiple challenges, do you see the region playing an important role in the global arena in some way or other? It, it can play an important role in two ways. First and foremost uh, is to quell any anxiety for the big player around uh, in terms of instability. If a Central Asia country fell, uh, the negative ripple effect are going to be extremely severe, not only for Central Asia's region, but for China, for Russia, even for the European Union. Having said that, a stable Central Asia is functional because uh, it will stop uh, not only a problem arising from uh, extremism, but as I mentioned before, something that is not much talk, but is very important is the drug trade. Uh, in Tajikistan, corruption along the border is rampant. Uh, Tajikistan has 1,000 kilometer border with Afghanistan, and opium trade in the area uh, is basically an economy itself uh, that uh, uh, it's related to sustain hundreds of families in the area 
And uh, I still recall when I was traveling intensively in the area that uh, the family were uh, on the border were bidding uh, with an important sum of money, collecting this money to have their son uh, get in a position uh, in the border patrol in order to, to benefit from, uh, from this uh, opioid trade. And it's quite interesting. If you look at the number in Tajikistan, there is no much drug addiction among the young population. And that's quite interesting because uh, they want uh, to shield the route uh, without having the problem related to drug trade. And there is a very important uh, number numbers in terms of drug that are moving from that area, going to Russia, going to the European Union, but also moving south, uh, going to Iran. Uh, heroin uh, is, a, is a huge problem in Iran right now, and most of it comes from uh, Afghanistan. So to answer the, the question, basically uh, a failing Central Asia is going to create an enormous amount uh, of problems for all the neighboring country, while at the same time uh, an efficient uh, developed Central Asia is going to promote better connection. And this connection can have, as I mentioned before, even having dairy product uh, from Kazakhstan reaching Singapore. Before we move to a couple of questions related to Central Asia and um, Southeast Asia, Asif Shuja, another colleague of ours at the Middle East Institute is asking that with both China and India having a deep strategic uh, engagement in Tajikistan, do you feel that Tajikistan, or how do you feel that Tajikistan is gonna be able to balance between the two powers? Look, on, uh, on this, uh, I'm not sure uh, if I have enough data to give you a proper answer. Uh, what I see now is uh, Tajikistan is still linked to a very strong uh, embrace with Russia in terms of defense cooperation. As I mentioned before, Russian military base in Tajikistan amount to more than 7,000 Russian troops in land. The two recent war games called Brotherhood showcase to Afghanistan what is going to happen in case uh, Afghanistan and the Taliban are not able uh, to contain a uh, uh, terrorist attack uh, from Afghanistan to Tajikistan. Having said that, China uh, increases economic presence, but also his security presence, and not only with the military base. The military base was used uh, before just a few months per year in training Afghan uh, mountain soldiers. Now that uh, the Afghan government uh, fall to the Taliban is no more the case, uh, and China absorbed this base uh, for its own border operation together with Tajikistan. But not only for uh, economical cooperation. Uh, China already started several years ago to transfer border control military equipment uh, to Tajikistan. So you can see there is uh, an increasing competition in the security sphere with uh, Chinese influence and Russian influence. Uh, where India play into this, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know very well, but when I, I was in the area, I didn't see much of India working on Tajikistan compared to what uh, Russia was doing and with what China is promising. Uh, moving to um, Southeast Asia, uh, Edwina is asking whether Central, and you mentioned Central Asian countries looking at Singapore, Edwina is asking whether Central Asian countries have increased their engagement, not only with Singapore, but also with uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, for example, and if so, in, with, in, what, in what areas, whether that was education, tourism, business. Um, and we also have a question from Alfin Febrian Basundoro, which is sort of borderline, I think, but you know, I'll leave it up to you whether you feel you want to answer it, which is, what are considerations that the Singaporean government should take into account on, in deciding whether or not to recognize the Taliban? And is there a, a contribution that Singapore can make in terms of peace and stability in Afghanistan? Okay, um, and James, remember, as you mentioned before, beside the uh, senior and the two decades, uh, one question per time because I'm easy to forget stuff. I will say that, getting to the first question, yes. Uh, it's important the relationship uh, that uh, Central Asia and especially Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are looking with Asian. Of course, as I mentioned before, Singapore is the role model. The story of Singapore being from a third country uh, to a first country in one generation. 
is still working extremely well in Central Asia. But then there are other countries uh, that Central Asian countries are looking at uh, for increased economic cooperation. Uh, investment, for example, there are investment in food and beverage, uh, looking at uh, halal product to be sold uh, in Indonesia and in Malaysia, but also religious tourism. So we are not only looking at religious tourism uh, moving uh, to Mecca and Medina, but also looking uh, at having uh, a, a take on uh, the ancient Silk Road uh, and the role of Islam uh, in, uh, in Central Asia. And that's something that uh, Central Asian countries are looking at portraying uh, in Asia, especially uh, with uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, getting to the question uh, uh, on Singapore, Afghanistan, we are moving a little bit out of the, the Central Asian sphere, but let's say including Afghanistan in, in the picture. I mean, Singapore, during the time of uh, the evacuation, cooperated sending an, uh, an airplane in exfiltrating uh, uh, civilian from Afghanistan, and Singapore always cooperated in the, in the stabilization process. Uh, uh, until the Ghani government. Uh, the question now is not if Singapore is going uh, to recognize or not Taliban or whatever. I don't see any country, uh, including China and uh, Russia, uh, looking at an official recognition of the government uh, in, the, in the coming weeks or, or, or months. Uh, the biggest issue now, in my personal opinion, uh, is not recognizing Taliban or not, because from a legal point of view, recognizing the Taliban means that the United States will have to send back $9 billion of the Afghan Central Bank that are in New York, or that they will have to open their airspace and that the Taliban could choose to close the airspace to drones and so on. While, for example, Pakistan and Imran Khan just uh, agreed to give again to the United States the possibility to fly armored drone over Pakistan. Having said that, uh, uh, the question is that recognizing or not recognizing the Taliban government, uh, the biggest issue now is a humanitarian crisis, a looming humanitarian crisis uh, that is related to uh, not only to wave, increasing wave of migrants, uh, but the problem of an economy in Afghanistan who has been based basically on two pillars. One, external donors, two, opioid trade. And of course, uh, we are looking at the government uh, called Taliban 2.0, that is trying to centralize the government function in a country that has been at war for 40 years and that has been married by decentralized structure for hundreds of years. And I don't see any of these uh, coming uh, as efficient of, as a possibility in the months to come. So the issue that all the countries, including Singapore, have to play is to try to find uh, a stable Afghanistan without a looming humanitarian crisis. Otherwise, another civil war is going to have a domino effect that will hit Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, probably spreading to Uzbekistan, and then uh, in the years to come can have a very negative ripple effect uh, reaching not only China or Europe, but moving moving on from that area. So I hope I, I answered the, the question. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Bao Xuan asks, how effective is China's vaccine diplomacy in Central Asia? Okay, uh, I mean, uh, China vaccine diplomacy started with a bang in Central Asia as well as in Europe and then had some backslash in terms of efficiency of Sinovac vaccination, but still was quite important early on as it showed China not only capabilities in terms of logistics, but willingness to provide support. Uh, uh, Central Asia and COVID, uh, uh, as for everybody, is going to be uh, a very bleak story, especially in terms of uh, not only on people that are dying, but for, for economic recovery. As I mentioned before, Central Asia was hit pretty bad uh, during the economic crisis in 2008, uh, and then now COVID-19 uh, is going to impair economic development for the years to come, with IMF already predicting uh, a severe decrease of GDP output for the next year or even uh, 2023. Back to the question of uh, vaccination diplomacy, you can make a comparison with the Middle East uh, when still uh, uh, China 
uh, effectiveness in the vaccination in some time is uh, is getting into question but country like uae agreed to be a, a regional hub for the production of the chinese vaccine and this is quite important in terms of the so-called mask and vaccine diplomacy but now we will have to see uh, how the china model in terms of, of uh, addressing the pandemic is going to play because with all the world in a way or the other opening up with singapore for example having vtl with the increasing number of country and accepting the fact that we are slowly moving to consider the pandemic endemic country like china is one of the few countries that remain like new zealand on the covid zero objective so how long China will be able to stay closed? It's very difficult to travel to China now. You have to do a quarantine that is uh, 14 plus seven if you are in the big city or become something like 21 even plus seven if you are going uh, in more remote area on other province. So the question is that how this uh, uh, is going to play uh, on the long game for China vaccination diplomacy if China is not going to change uh, this trajectory especially now that we are looking at the winter olympic in beijing for uh, for the year to come while other country and we move back to the middle east uh, like in we are seeing with the world expo now in doha to make all the necessary screening swab testing but uh, increasing the number of vaccinated tourists that are able to try uh, to travel and uh, and look uh, at the world expo 2020 so I apologize, I answered to your question with another question, uh, but that's uh, probably the structure of what we will see in the pattern developing in the, in the months to come. And the big question will hinge not only in the efficiency of the Chinese vaccine diplomacy, but the efficiency of the Chinese model, if it's going to uh, be more flexible or not under this COVID zero uh, restriction that is still maintaining right now. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Another question out of the audience is that given the fact that water scarcity is a major issue in Central Asia and threatens to be a flashpoint, are you seeing concerted efforts to jointly tackle the problem in the region? Yes, for example, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I have a, a straightforward answer. Yes, it's a problem. Yes, it's been addressed. No, it's not going to be completely addressed. SEO cooperation, for example, this multilateral institution that was called Shanghai Five in the 90s had basically three pillars. One pillar, as mentioned before, was anxiety over Afghanistan, uh, negative spillover. The second pillar was border dispute mostly uh, also related to Russia, China, and some part China and Central Asia. And this has been more or less addressed, but water issues are still there. There are two main rivers, Amudaria and the other river, that are still con basically crossing China and uh, multiple countries in Central Asia. And the downstream country are still uh, disputing how the water is going to be addressed. And unfortunately, uh, with the looming crisis coming from the climate change, uh, these problems are going to intensify exponentially and can create uh, friction and even flashpoint uh, if there is no better mechanism and I'm looking at an economic mechanism of compensation for the country who lose the water and that support uh, uh, for addressing this issue. But if you look at the picture that we used at just at the beginning of this presentation, how the picture of the RLC shrinking in only 20 years let you address the issue that uh, climate change and uh, the, border, the, the water dispute between Central Asian countries, unfortunately, are going uh, to be a severe point of friction between the country. And unless uh, there is uh, an international willingness to support the country, to talk among them, the problem only among Central Asian country is not uh, to, to be resolved. That's very easy because we are talking about economic system that are very vulnerable, especially in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, that are economy that are related uh, mostly on uh, informal economy and uh, you have a social protection system for the health and as well for the small medium business and especially the one in the informal economy that are affected on seasonal basis by the lack of water 
and this is going only to increase uh, in, a, in a negative way and it will hamper local consumption, local investment uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, all uh, the environmental degradation that this uh, is already creating. As I mentioned before, extractive industry is uh, at the core of all this country. You have gold mine in Tajikistan, uh, other kind of uh, rare earth mineral from Kyrgyzstan, oil and gas, uh, especially uh, uranium and plutonium in Kazakhstan. And these are highly polluting industry that are also complicating the picture on uh, water usage and the conflict in addressing the scarcity of water in the in the months to come. So unfortunately, I'm giving a, a quite, uh, uh, let's say, bleak picture of, uh, of the future on water dispute. But water dispute is something that it will be not only a, a challenge, it's already a very challenging issue for Central Asia, but it's also an issue in other areas of the world from the Middle East. Uh, and we see especially now in the Horn of Africa uh, between Ethiopia, Grand Renaissance Dam, uh, Egypt uh, and Sudan. And uh, this is only going to increase uh, in, the, in the days to come. A bleak but realistic picture. Um, we are unfortunately coming to the end of this illuminating session. I want to uh, pose the last question by Georgi um, and then ask you, Alex, also to give you any final thoughts that you may have before we round this off. Georgi's question is whether or not Russians or ethnic Russians face any, face any degree of uh, discrimination in Central Asia, and if so, whether that's an issue of importance for Russia. Yes, uh, I think we have four minutes before the end and with this question I will need a couple of hours to give you a proper answer. As I mentioned before, uh, there is a presence coming from the Soviet time uh, of ethnic Russian in Central Asia and mostly uh, you can see in the eastern part uh, of Kazakhstan. Uh, in this area, uh, they are an important part of the population. Uh, there is a perception when I was living there, I was asking a lot this question of discrimination in some part uh, into the fact that you need the Kazakh language now, while for them was just using Russian. But uh, uh, I didn't have uh, this, uh, let's say, gut feeling perception of huge discrimination. While at the same time, uh, uh, we don't have to forget that there is one game that Russia uh, is used to play very well. And is the fact to be able to move back and forward in controlling uh, neighboring countries. When the time is ripe, when the power is there, they can jump in. When uh, they feel weaker and they need to just scale back the control, uh, Russia is able to do it. And I'm not talking about today Russia only or Soviet Russia. I'm also talking about Tsarist Russia. In this respect, Central Asian countries know it very well. Uh, to answer uh, Georgi's question, when I was living in Almaty at the time, uh, uh, President Putin made uh, a comment on Nazarbayev, mentioning that thanks to Nazarbayev, Kazakhstan exists. And we will see what is going to happen when uh, Nazarbayev is no more there. So uh, it has been read in Russia as a prize to deficiency vision of President Nazarbayev, but uh, most of the local uh, uh, Kazakh, and uh, it was discussing with my, my friend, they were afraid that it was a valid message that when Nazarbayev was no more there, Russia was back, was going to get Kazakhstan back. And then, of course, uh, it's a discourse that in some different degree all Central Asia have, and uh, one of the doubt, uh, looking at what happened, uh, what happened in Ukraine, especially in the Donbas area, is uh, if uh, ethnic Russian are going to be used as an excuse to jump in in order to protecting them and using military force. Uh, this was uh, discussed ten years ago or more. Is no more on the table at the moment. But it doesn't mean uh, that this kind uh, of fear from Central Asia about uh, uh, a return of Russian stronger embrace uh, uh, is still there. And uh, just as we have one minute, I will conclude uh, with a story that I've heard a lot uh, in the bazaar, in the market, all over Central Asia, when asking uh, 
about Russia and China. Uh, Turkey and India were not in the picture at the time. Uh, and uh, most of the same story from uh, Tajikistan to Kazakhstan was that still Central Asia preferred the embrace of the bear because the bear can crush you, can destroy you, but your bones will be there while the dragon will burn you and your bones will be scattered to ashes. On that note, before I uh, thank you, Alex, and uh, the MEI Invest team, let me please invite everybody for next week's final session of the um, MEI 101 series, which will be with the chairman of the Institute, Ambassador Bilahari Kausikan, in which he is willing, or uh, said that he is willing to address any questions you may have. I'm sure it will be a, a exciting and interesting session, and I really urge you to join us next week, Thursday at about the same time. Alex, thank you. This was really a very, very in-depth overview and, and, and uh, with some grilling questions. Uh, but nonetheless, thank you very much for this. And thank you very much for the MEI events team. I'm afraid this is the end of the session and we hope to see you next week. Thank you to the audience and thank you for all the great session and from being from the beginning to the end of the event. Thank you again.